everyone, it's Nancy at Civic and Painting Hamden. Thanks for joining me today. We're going to be painting this lovely painting called Changing Seasons. And to do that, we're gonna need some paint. So we're gonna need blue, red, yellow, white, and black. Just the three primary colors and white and black, easy. We're also going to need water in a container, got mine in a jar. Some brushes, a variety of brush sizes. I have a small, medium, and large. And some napkins. I have on my apron, and I have my beverage. So I'm good to go. What do you say, let's get started. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to wet my canvas. I can do that with a spritzer. That's really the easy way. Or I can pick up my biggest brush and just cover the whole canvas with water. The reason I'm doing this is Denver is very dry and we have a very dry climate. And so acrylic paint dries out really quickly here. So I need to stay one step ahead of it and keep it, keep it wet so my paint will um, move across the canvas. Let's see if I can shed some light on this little bit. All right. So we've got this, we've got some water on a 16 by 20 canvas. You don't have to paint on anything this large. You can paint on whatever size you like. Um, I want to paint on a big painting so that you can see exactly what I'm doing. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up my big brush and I'm going to put one side of it in white paint. And then I'm going to put the other side of it in red paint. So I've red on one side, white on the other. And then I'm just going to make streaks going back and forth. And you'll see by using the side of my brush, I'm getting a little red on there, I'm getting a little white on there. What I want to do is just create a background of horizontal, soft, pastel streaks for my background. So when I run out of paint, I'm going to pick up a little more white because I want this to be a very pale background. Now, if you don't want to use pink, you could use whatever color you like. So if you wanted blue and white, that would make a beautiful painting. If you wanted yellow and white, that would make a beautiful painting as well. You decide what color background you want. I'm gonna to stick to using my original painting here as my guide. Now we paint, we have 500 different paintings in our gallery here at Sipping and Painting Hamden. So uh, all of our paintings were painted earlier by our guest artists that we have here at the studio teaching classes for us. So my paint colors might not match their paint colors exactly. When we do our, our virtual classes on YouTube and um, for virtual fundraisers, like we did for this one, uh, for little pop-up libraries in Aurora, when we paint our paintings uh, in the studio, we might pick from a bunch of different kind colors of paint. But for our, uh, virtual classes, we just stick to the basic primary colors, yellow, blue, and red, and then black and white, and then we mix what we need. So mine won't match this exactly perfectly, but you'll see we're gonna come really close. And like I said, if you don't want white and red making pink in your background, pick up some white, a little bit of water, and whatever color you speaks to you, whatever you like. That's what you should do. This is a very pale background. So I just want to make sure I don't have anything too vibrant. Now the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to paint the same texture, the same background on the sides of my canvas, on the frame part, on the top, and on the bottom, there's this, another side. And the reason I'm doing that is that way I don't have to put it in a frame. 
that's called a gallery wrap. And when I hang it on the wall, if the sides are painted, it looks finished. And then I don't have to spend money on a frame. So that's a big plus. And I'm gonna put it on the bottom as well. Let's see. You don't need very much paint for the tops and sides and the bottom. And they sure don't have to be perfect because they won't get a lot of attention when you're looking at them. All right, so I have this really lovely, nice pastel background. And because we're painting this virtually, I'm gonna keep going in a moment. And you may wanna put your background on and then give it some time to dry. That's completely up to you. And the beauty of doing this virtually is you can stop the recording when it's dry, uh, which will only take about five minutes because we put this on so lightly. Then you can turn your, uh, the recording back on and watch the rest. I'm just waiting for a siren to go by <clears throat> and drink a little water. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you how to make the color brown because you'll see, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put in these sticks, these trunks. Well, first let's put in a few that are black, okay? And so I'm gonna start them about four fingers up from the bottom and I'm only, and then it's gonna go in this section right here. So I'm gonna put, one, two, using my tiny brush and just a tiny bit of paint and a little tiny bit of pressure. And I don't want them to be perfectly spread apart. I want them to be random. So I've got a few black ones on. I'm gonna show you how to make brown. I'm gonna take a little bit of blue. I'm gonna take a little bit of red and a little bit of yellow. So all three primary colors, when you mix them together, creates brown. I used to have a hard time remembering that. I couldn't remember which colors before, before I really got experience with art. And then I remembered, oh, Christmas green. That's a good way to remember it. Christmas brown, rather. And what that means is red and green together. And the reason red and green is because green is made up of blue and yellow. So when you put together blue and yellow and red, you get brown. So I'm gonna put some more of these very loose trunks on my canvas. And the way I'm gonna do that, let me just show you. When you're, when you're applying the paint on your brush, spin it a bit and pull backward and that's gonna sharpen your brush so you get a finer point. And then when I put it on, I'm gonna barely touch, I'm barely holding this, this brush with the lightest touch possible. And I'm just gonna whisk up and I'm gonna not make my trunk straight. I don't want them straight because in real life, trees are not straight. If I spin my brush as I go, I get nice crooked trees. And that's what I want because if you went out into a forest, trees would never be the same height. No two trees are the, sorry, not the same height, the same um, uh, straightness, the same, no two trees are perfectly the same. That's what I'm trying to say. And so I'm gonna spin my brush a bit and start some higher, some lower. I'm gonna put some right next to each other and some are farther apart. This painting looks like it has about 20. Some are starting really high. Some are starting low. In general, the higher ones should be the fainter ones because they're far away in the background. Far away, far away. So real soft with those. And this one's pretty fat, so I'm gonna change him. I'm gonna make him farther down so he makes sense, right? Because farther down means that the tree trunk is closer. And if it's closer, it needs to look larger. And then the ones that are far away in the background, well, they're just gonna be barely touching the canvas, soft as a feather. Oops, I didn't do that one soft as a feather. I'm gonna make him taller. Let me try that again, less paint. All right, I'm gonna try that with less paint. So soft as a feather as I spin. And pull up. 
none of this has to be perfect. None of it has to be perfect because it doesn't really matter. The attention is going to be in this beautiful foliage. Plus, this is a very loose painting. What I mean by loose is it's pretty impressionistic. See those tree trunks up close? They're, they're messy like mine are. There's nothing uniform or perfect about it. In fact, perfection is the enemy of an impressionistic painting. You want it to be very loose, very loose. Sometimes you have to have a little bit of beer or wine to make loose paintings, trust me. So if you don't have enough black, you can put in a few black ones, but I don't want to overdo it. So I think I'm going to call that that done. I, I do see a couple of gray ones in here. Let me see if I can try a gray one. And so that was just black with a little bit of white on it. On the brush at the same time, a little white. Let me see if I can get a couple of gray ones. That's kind of gray. Let me put it, try a gray one over here. So I did a gray one. I just, I had black on my brush. I just picked up a little white. Yeah, there we go. I'm um, gray. So I have the idea is that I have different shades of black and brown and even a little gray. And they're not straight, they're not perfect. Just like those aren't straight and those aren't perfect. That's what I want. Because if you looked out in a forest, all the trunks wouldn't be perfectly straight and perfectly uh, distanced apart. If you did find them that way, it would really be like at Disney World and it wouldn't look natural. So you want to make sure it looks natural. So go ahead, take, take all the time you need. Stop your recording and take all the time you need on those trees, okay? Okay, hopefully you stopped the recording, you took all the time you need on those trees, and I'm going to keep on going. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the shadows. And what I mean by the shadow, oh, actually, I'm going to do the, the bottom. I just remembered. I'm going to do the bottom. Now, the bottom is made of this heather gray, which is basically a bluish gray. So I take a little bit of white, plop it down there, a little bit of blue, plop it down there, and a little tiny bit of black. Black goes a long way. And then I'm going to mix those together. I only need a little bit. I really don't need much at all. So what I'm going for is a bluish gray. They used to do, years ago, lots of people decorated their kitchens in this color. A heather gray. So a little blue, a little black, a little white. And I'm going to keep mine marbly. I'm not even going to blend it all together because I want different shades of blue in it too. And I'm going to try to approximate where they put it in this painting, but it's not going to be perfect because I'm not trying for perfect. I'm using my large brush. Now I'm going to try to avoid the, those trees if I can, because they're still kind of, mine are still kind of wet. So I'm going to avoid those tree trunks and I'm just going to scritch scratch. That's a science word, right? I mean an art word. I'm just going to kind of scratch on some of this color and I'm really not making it perfect. You can see I'm, I don't have much paint on my brush. In fact, it's pretty much a dry brush at this point. And by using a dry brush, I get a dry brush technique. And what that means is it's very thin and hazy looking rather than a solid color. And that's, that's what I'm going for here. Okay, good. Now I'm going to make the same kind of combination for this red. So remember before we did blue and black and white, but now I want this more cranberry color. So I'm going to use a little red and then a little black and a little white. Just a little black, remember, not too much. It goes a long, long way. And then I'm going to mix that around until I get a maroon. And I'm not going to blend it in perfectly. See, it's not blended perfectly. And I'm going to just kind of lay that in where the other one was approximately. Now my paint might be a little thinner. 
uh, thicker rather than the one that I'm painting with, uh, copying, because mine's going on more solid and that one's more scratch scratched. That's okay, every painting's different. Um, I say this in some of my other classes, and some of you may have heard this before, but when I, I'm certified in Bob, uh, teaching Bob Ross oils as well, and when I went down to Florida, I, uh, I'm going to just clean my brush, by the way, and rub this out a little bit so it's less, it's more diffuse. So I just clean my brush and just kind of rubbing it so it's not so thick. All right. Then it's going to resemble more the scritch scratch of that one. Okay, anyway, I was going to tell you that. So I had the privilege of seeing quite a few Bob Ross original paintings down there. And even when he was painting the same composition more than once, they, don't, they didn't look the same. So every time you say paint the same painting, it's not going to look the same. Because it depends on how much sleep you had the night before, uh, whatever's on your mind that comes through in your paint. Bob used to say if there's a... If you're angry when you're painting, it's going to show up. So you don't want to do that. But if you you are having a bad day and you pick up your paintbrush, you can paint yourself happy because you know what? Painting is very relaxing and soothing. And before you know it, you'll forget all about your troubles. So I'm just putting a little white down there because I think I overdid the red a bit. And that's the great beauty of acrylic paint is you can go back and forth and you can fix things all you want, all you want. It's your world, your painting, you fix it your way. You make it just what you want. So if you have a little bit too much paint in there, let it dry a bit and then put some white over it. No one's gonna question it. No one's ever gonna see the original painting you're doing that you're copying uh, or that you used as an inspiration. They're just going to see yours and they're going to think you're an absolute genius. So I can put on some lighter shades in there and just kind of brush them out until I'm happy. So you get the bottom the way you want it to be. But remember, this is a very loose painting. And if you do anything too fussy, it's going to detract from all these beautiful blossoms or um, leaves up on top. So don't overdo the bottom. That's why I'm removing some of the color because I don't want it to compete with my beautiful trees when I get my trees on there. All right, so mine doesn't match the original. Do I care? Not in the slightest, not in the slightest because I know that my painting is going to reflect my personality and the kind of day that I had and what I'm thinking about. It's never going to be a perfect copy of someone else's and I don't want it to be. And, and I hope you don't want yours to be either. Let your personality come through in your painting. All right, again, this is a good time to stop your recording and catch up to where I am. All right, so hopefully you stopped your recording and you got caught up. And I'm going to keep on, while I'm letting all this dry, I'm going to keep on going and I'm going to put in my shadows on the trees. And I'm going to do that with my medium brush. I'm just going to dab it in my black paint. And then I'm going to look for some of these bigger tree trunks and I'm going to dab on what will become shadows under the tree. But the reason I'm doing it in that shape is I want it to be that there's clumps of trees. Do you see how this clump, there's this clump, and 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 there's this clump. There's this clump. I'm not exactly sure if each clump represents one tree or just a collection of trees that are close together but I want to have separate clumps, little separate groupings of trees. So on the bigger ones, I'm just going to kind of create this umbrella kind of look, upside down umbrella or a smiley face. And I'm just picking out these bigger ones. And then 
I don't want them to be the exact same height. And I don't want it to be perfect. I don't want it to look like a big old smiley face. But just in general, it's kind of that shape. These will become the shadows underneath the beautiful array of leaves. And real loose, real loose with the kinds of shapes that I'm doing. Don't, don't make it too perfect, okay? Don't make anything too perfect in this painting. All right, so these are my shadows, the underneath parts of the tree. And so, yes, there, they may be some dark leaves, but they also are the shadows below the leaves. Because the sun's gonna be way up here. And so the way we show that the sun is up here is we, well, we make the bottoms darker and then we make the tops lighter. Do you see how all of these trees have white mixed in with the color? You can see it up close. See now there's white at the top. And that's how we tell the viewer the sun is at the top of this painting. But at the bottom, we need to put in those shadows. And I can use whatever's left on my brush to just tap in a few more. It'll just kind of blend in with the trees up above a bit. I didn't pick up any more paint. This is just kind of cleaning my brush by dabbing on what's left. And then I'm really truly going to, uh, actually I don't even need to clean my brush because if your brush is dry enough, you don't have to. You can move into the brown. But if your brush is still wet, clean it. Give it a good clean. Give it a good. And when I clean my brushes, I put them in the water a ton. I let the water do all of the work. That way I don't go through 5,000 napkins. I've seen people do that. And so basically I let the water do the work and now all I have to do is just dab it on the napkin. And that way I can go through one or two napkins instead of 50. All right. So I'm still gonna use my medium brush for all of the rest of this painting, if you can believe it. One brush. I'm gonna pick up some brown. Remember that brown we made? If you don't have any more, what three colors go into brown? Yellow, blue, and red. I am gonna to have to mix up some more, but I'm gonna go ahead and use up the rest of what I have first. And I'm gonna tap in on top of and slightly above those shadows we put in with the black, I'm gonna put in some brown. And then maybe a few up. So right on top of the black, but then also a little bit above and a few randoms. And this is putting in the next layer of color. We're gonna go darkest to lightest. And remember what I said, the top of the trees is gonna be bright and have lots of white in it. I'm gonna to need to make some more paint myself, a little red, a little yellow, and I don't go into the middle of the color when I'm mixing. I wanna keep it fresh, that, the middle of it. So I just kind of scoot it from the side so I'm not contaminating the whole pile of color. I'm just using what I need. You can see how I just scooted it into the middle. A little of this, a little of that, a little of this, and mix them. And I'm gonna have a nice, nice brown. All right, so more brown. So right above, and if I have any other colors because I didn't mix it well, awesome, consider that a good thing. Because these are impressionistic trees. Remember, they're not perfect. They're not supposed to be. Uh, when, I was really fortunate enough, uh, my husband and I went to see Monet's garden at Giovanni in France last year. I was really a treat. I looked forward to that my whole life. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. But what I took away from that is I remember someone saying there that when Monet painted, it was a very different style than what people were used to. And they said to him, what you're doing looks like an underpainting. It doesn't look finished compared to the realistic paintings of, you know, in the, in the classical painting world at the time. And he said, when I'm painting, 
is when you look at something and then look away, I'm painting your memory of it. That's pretty cool, huh? So now there's lots of impressionistic painting, but at the time he was really, uh, really someone way ahead of his time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna add a little bit more because I'm noticing these in the middle are lower. So I'm gonna add a bit more just to these ones in the middle. Just a bit more. My painting's not gonna look like the original when I'm done and yours is not gonna look like mine or the original and that's what we want. We don't want anyone's to look like a carbon copy of anyone else's because that's not creativity, that's copying, right? So let, let your personality come through. All right. So at this point, it's a good time for you to stop your video, uh, your recording and catch up. And I'm gonna just keep right on rocking and rolling. All right. So hopefully you, you got all caught up and now let's go to the next step. So what I'm gonna do now is think about these clumps. So here I have a clump that's mostly blue. Here I have a clump that's mostly yellow. Here I have a clump that's mostly red. Here I have a clump that's mostly purple. Here I have a clump that's all different colors, red and then green and then yellow in two different little clumps. So maybe that's a little, you know, grouping of trees that are all different species um, or changing at a different time. Now at this point, you can go in one of two ways. You can go with all of these rainbow colors and in clumps, of course, that's what we're gonna do. Or you could say, I don't want blue and purple trees. I don't see those in nature. And you could do yellow and red and orange and brown, yellow and red and orange as you would normally see realistically outside. I'm gonna go ahead and do these fanciful colors because I happen to like it. Uh, but you do you. And if you are making uh, just fall colors, yellow, orange, red, brown, then just so you know, red plus yellow equals orange, okay? So for those of you doing that, go for it. Now, for those who are following me, we're going to think about clumps. I'm gonna do a blue clump, I'm gonna do a red clump, I'm gonna do a yellow clump, I'm gonna do a purple clump, and then I'm gonna mix in some random little clumps of different colors as I go. And that way I will get this impressionistic effect. Okay, so you can see with the blue, that is not just straight on blue. I'll show you what straight on blue would look like if I did that. It's pretty solid looking, pretty uh, kind of dark. So that's nothing wrong with that. I'm gonna pick up a little bit of white and I'm gonna mix it in. I'm gonna make a new pile of a little bit of white and a little bit of blue and I'm gonna make a lighter blue. Now in the kits that we sell here at the studio and when we do our fundraisers, we give people this color called ultramarine blue. And it's a really nice blue uh, for doing a lot of different things. This color, which the original artist did years ago, is probably more of a phthalo or a cobalt blue. And there's so many different kinds of blue. Oh my goodness, if you go to the art store, you will go crazy with all of your options. And really, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference which blue you pick. It really doesn't, unless you're going for something that looks exactly a particular way. But if you're just trying to make a pretty landscape, any blue will do. And we are today using ultramarine blue. And I, I actually really like this. I, I really like ultramarine blue. It's what they call a warmer blue. And what that means is it has a tiny bit of purple in it. And I think that's kind of fun, I, I like that. All right, but if you have other blues at home, experiment, do what you like. So notice that I'm not making a complete oval. I don't want it to look like I circled on a hash brown or uh, cotton candy. I want it, and notice how I put loose up here. These are just loose and random more up here because 
that's indicating some trees that are maybe on faraway branches that I can't see. I just want it to look natural. And then in this next clump of yellow, notice how there's some blue in there. So I'm gonna put some blue in there. And that's even a little bit darker in spots. So I can pick up a little of the more solid. And then I see it down here too. So I'm gonna put in some over here. And look at that big clump there. I'm gonna put some over there and I'm just gonna do one color at a time. This go round, I'm doing blue. And there's blue down in here, and there's blue in here. Now, if you didn't turn off the recording and let some of it dry, then some of this will be wet. So you're gonna have to be careful because if you paint wet on wet, then you will probably end up with a lot of brown. So you're gonna have to be very careful and put it just in the spaces or let it dry a bunch. There's a word to the wise, okay? All right, so I've got blue, blue, so I've got this blue, I've got this blue. Oh, there's a few random little, see those? Okay, and then I've got some in here, I've got some up here, and then, oh, there's a few in that red. And I think that's about it, I run out of blue. All right, so that may be it on my blue. Okay, now I at the tops of every tree, I'm gonna add a little white to whatever I'm doing. And the reason is what we talked about. There's sun shining on the tops of these trees. So you wanna make that the lightest part of the tree is to have some white in there near the tops and kind of random. Don't cover up your blue, just add to it with some white, okay? And a little, a little over here maybe. All right, good. This would be a very good time to stop your painting. Clean your brush really well. And wait for me to go on to the next color. But, and, and to catch up. But since I'm painting virtually, I'm gonna go ahead. I think that those of you who turned off the recording and caught up, you're probably ready to go because you press play again and here we go. I'm gonna start doing this yellow tree right here. Now the yellow, here's the thing about yellow paint. Yellow pigments in general are not as strong as blue pigments. So if you're painting yellow, just be aware it might, might not be as powerful, it might not stick quite as much as the blues. So if that happens to you, think about, consider adding a little bit of white to it. I'll show you. Because then the yellow pops more. Hold on one second, I'll show you. If I add a little bit of white to some yellow, the yellow, see that? The yellow sticks a little bit better to the canvas and I get a more opaque, which means can't see through it kind of yellow. I don't know if you can see the difference. Okay. All right, watch this one. It just shows up a little bit better when it has a little white in it. So adding a tiny bit of white to your yellow will often give it some stick to itiveness. Stick to itiveness. I'm gonna go with that word. All right, and then there's yellow kind of randomly over here. Let me see if I can duplicate something like that. I've got some down in here. I've got some down in here. And then where the yellow overlaps with the blue, what color do you think we get? Anybody? Take a guess. That's right, we get green. So where the yellow overlaps with the blue, we get green. Okay. So far, so good. Now you'll see that this area here is a little richer and that's because to the yellow, 
they added a tiny bit of red. So where I scooched my yellow and my red together, I'm just gonna steal some of that. That's kind of a mustardy color. And if I put that in, it's a little, a little deeper yellow or gold. It's not quite orange because I didn't put enough red in it, but it just gives me a little deeper gold when I, when I do that. Maybe I want a little bit of that color in here too. And again, I'm just tap, tap, tapping. I'm trying to avoid the really wet areas of something I've done before. So I give that a little time to dry. Now I'm gonna come over here, do you see those? Oh wait, in this red one, there's a big blob. See that, Boop. And then a little bit in here, down here. Now over there, I've got that pile and it's got a tiny bit of red in it. Do you see it over here? Let's try to duplicate something like that over here. Now my brush had a tiny, tiny bit of just the tiniest amount of red on it. So it made that yellow a little more like a gold. And then over here, and I'm just kind of looking in this general area and I'm not trying to be perfect. Remember, perfection is the enemy of art, but I'm trying to get to approximate rather than copy. There's some more down here. And then it looks like there was some blue there because I see green. You see that? So I must have missed some blue down here. But when I turn my brush and spin it around and some is yellow and some is blue, what do I get? I get some green. Let the paint do the work. All right, looks like there's a little green here too. Maybe a little up in here. All right, so far so good. There's a little bit more yellow down in this. Somewhere. There's some more colors down in here. They're kind of random, so I'm gonna have to add a bunch of lit, just tiny amounts of different colors in those shadows very tiny amounts. All right. So how do I know when I've got it? If I'm happy. And, and a really good, a good skill for any artist, whether you're beginning or old uh, accomplished artist, is step back 20 feet and take a look at your painting from far away because you can't see it up close. I'm just putting a little white at the tops of these trees. Remember we talked about that? Uh, you can't see your painting from far away. You just can't from close up. You just can't. You can't. You, it's kind of like your family, you know? Boy, they can drive you crazy. But then when you're away from a bit, you really miss them because then you kind of remember who they are in the world and the, con and the context of your life. And... It's the same with the painting. You just need to step away so you can really see it the way others do. And I recommend about 15, 20 feet. No one is gonna come into your house and put their nose in your painting. Well, hopefully they won't, that'd be kind of rude, right? Um, and if you go to a museum, they're not, you know, people are putting their nose in the painting. The, the security guards would get very upset if they did that. They, they have you stand back about 10 feet, right? Sometimes across the room. Wait, Monet's and Van Gogh's, people were standing really far to see them because that's how you can really see their beauty is from far away. In fact, the Monet's and Van Gogh's look terrible up close. Um, <laughs> that, was what, that was what my takeaway. Uh, but anyway, like I said, they're gonna look better from 10 to 15 feet away and that's what you wanted to see because that's the viewing distance. That's where it is normal and natural to view a painting is 10 to 15 feet away. All right, now, oh my goodness, I didn't leave room for red and purple. I'm gonna have to squeeze red and purple in there, but you know what? That's okay, every painting's different, right? I got a little carried away with my yellow. I think I like yellow. 
but every pane's different. So if you have more room, and we can also add purple elsewhere. Let me show you how to make some purple. Purple, and again, if you are not where I am, stop the video, stop the recording, catch up, and turn it back on. All right, here's how you make purple. You just mix red and blue. It could not be more easy. Red and blue make purple. Now, that purple is very dark, and I don't want a very, very dark purple. I'll show you how dark it is in my canvas. It's too dark for me. See how dark that is? Way too dark for me. I can put a few in there, but I'm gonna pick up a little bit of white, a little bit of white, mix it in with my purple, and then I'm gonna get a lighter shade of purple. If you put in a lot of white, you're gonna get a lavender. Nothing wrong with that. But you decide what shade of purple you want. More red, more blue, more white, you decide. Just play with it a minute. Stop the video, play with your purple until you get one that you, you can live with, that you're gonna like. You're the one who's gonna be seeing this painting on your wall, not me. You, you pick exactly the purple you want, okay. So I've got some purples going and I'm gonna pick up some white, remember, in a bit, and I'm gonna tap on white on top of this. But for now, I'm just kind of laying in the blocks of purple. Blocks of purple. All right, then I'm gonna pick up some white. And I'm gonna put, remember, I'm gonna put the white more at the tops, but then I'm gonna overlap it as I go down. And again, my painting is gonna be quite different than the original, because I didn't leave a lot of room for red, but we're gonna do it. It's gonna be great. So this purple has some white in it now, see that? And put a little down there. You can put it wherever you want. You can put a few down here if you want. Just don't overdo it. It's interesting. There's a, some gray over here. You see that gray? I'm going to make some gray. A little white, a little red. Sorry, a little white, a little black. That makes gray on my brush. I'm going to tap in some gray because that has gray. First the gray, and then I'm gonna tap white over it. I don't know why they have gray there. Maybe it's just to keep the vibrancy in the center so you really appreciate it more. That could be. And actually, they have some gray down here in their shadows too, so what the heck, as long as I've got it on my brush, that's got some gray down there too. And it just draws your eye up into the bright colors when you have the drab colors on the sides of the painting or in the corners or underneath the trees. Because your eye is drawn to the contrast, the bright, bright colors. So this gray just kind of looks boring enough that it brings your eye up. It's just psychology. And remember, you can paint on the sides too as you go. All right. So you know, it's looking pretty good. And they have, even have some random ones. They don't have it too neat down here. Keep it loose. It's the exact opposite <laughs> advice my parents gave me when I was in college. They did not say keep it loose and fast. They did not. But when you're painting an abstract or a, not an abstract, but an impressionistic painting, keep it fast and loose. See how that, with a little bit of white, just looks like there's some sunlight up there. Little bits of gray here and there. And if you see any spots that you think, oh, I could have done that a little differently or that's missing a little color, just take care of it as you go, as you think about it. But again, don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. Keep it fast and loose. Okay. I love these colors, actually. This uh, blue is really great for making hydrangeas. So if you want to come in for another challenge sometime, join us when we're making hydrangeas because they're so pretty. We do that every so often. All right. So 
Now I've got on my blue. I've got on my red. Nope, no red. Got on my purple. Got on my yellow. And where the purple, sorry, where the blue and the yellow mix, that makes green. I've got different variations in tone and shape. So we're doing well. Now, my last color is red. And it's, I'm gonna fill it in all over where there's space. All right, red, here's your chance, red, let's go. Boom, red's gonna make this painting just pop. Ooh, I'm excited about the red. See how pretty that red is? Man, that's pretty. And where the red overlaps with the yellow, what color does it make? Different shades of orange. Boom, 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 boom. And uh, this, this popping motion that we're doing a lot in this painting, this is called stippling. The art word for it is stippling, stippling. And this painting is almost entirely stippling. Tons of stippling. Lots and lots of stippling. And at this point, I'm putting this on pretty darn thick, this red, real thick, in the space between the purple and the yellow. Remember, I'm going to put white up here. But lots of paint on my brush, and I'm just popping on yellow. And I'm not being neat and orderly, and I'm not making perfect ovals. I don't want to look like ash browns or uh, don't want it to look like a lollipop. Don't want a lollipop. When you watch South Park, which, which has its merits uh, in other ways, they do a lot of lollipop trees, you know, any cartoon would. We want to avoid lollipops. Okay, so notice over here, red, 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 like a little sea of red, back row, sea of red, another, like kind of shape of an ear of red. So I'm gonna put those in there. So some red, some red, and then some red, a little backward sea or an ear, some red, And those little clumps kind of suggest where maybe that's some branches sticking out in that shape. Oh, kind of the ends of branches, like the rounded ends. And then this purple has some in it as well. Oh, big, big rounded. So remember how we didn't have much room for the red, but we're putting it over other colors and it's doing fine. As long as I'm not putting it over green too much, it still stays. If I put it over yellow, I get orange. If I put it over blue, I get purple. So I'm trying to avoid putting the red over green because if I put it over green, I get brown. And I don't want brown. I want to keep these vibrant colors. And any place that looks like it got a little washed out by touching white or something, just pop some more red on it. It's okay. Why not? It's your painting, your world. All right, now I'm going to add a little bit of white to the tops of my trees and I'm getting really close to being done. So what do I do when I think I'm done? I think 80%. Now what I mean by that is when I'm 80% happy with my painting, I'm going to walk away. I want to sign it and walk away. Why? Because I've seen a lot of people fuss with their paintings too much at the end. You know, the class might be over and they stay another 30 minutes trying to make it perfect. And you know what ends up happening? They hate it when they leave because they overdid it. They were rushing and they, they did something and then they just get upset with themselves. They get frustrated. So we don't want to do that. We want to, we want to kind of feel like if whatever happens was meant to be a little bit. And so if I, if it's not perfect, it's not supposed to be perfect, right? So I'm going to, I'm just tapping a few other little colors in these black and gray areas. All right, so it's got a little bit of everything down here. 
And I'm just eyeballing it one more time. Now I'm gonna step away from my painting about 10 feet and I'm gonna look at it and see what others see. Because I can't see it here, I really can't. And I don't wanna keep tapping on so much that all the colors blend and I just have brown trees. So I'm gonna step away and wash my brush first. Always wash your brushes or they get ruined because acrylic paint dries very quickly. So I'm gonna wash my brushes and I'm gonna step away and I'm, I'm gonna look at it for a few minutes from far away. And I really encourage you to do the same. I didn't think it was possible to make this painting any brighter or bolder than it already was, but son of a gun, I did. I'm noticing I didn't put any white on the left side of this yellow tree, like there is here, but I couldn't see that from close up, but now I can see it. So I'm just gonna tap in a little bit of white in those areas. I think they even have a little bit of white in some spots down here, believe it or not. I guess they're going for contrast. And I'm not picking up any more paint. I just had a little bit of white on my brush and I'm just spinning my brush to get those last little remnants. There's kind of a clump right there. So, not sure why, but we'll go with it. And again, I'm not trying to have a perfect copy of the other paint of the first painting because that's someone else's painting. This is my painting. And mine is bigger and bolder. That's my style. What you're going to notice the more you paint is that you have a style. Everyone has a style when they paint. And it took me a lot of painting to figure out what my style was. But after, you know, 10, 12 paintings, what I learned about myself is I'm big. My, my style is go big or go home. So I tend to make my trees bigger, my flowers bigger, everything bigger. And I have to laugh because I came from a family of nine kids. So I think it may have had something to do with that. I learned go big or go home. Um, abundance, right? Abundance. Uh, you're gonna have your own style. Maybe your painting is more subtle. Maybe this is just a little too crazy for you. Good, good. You paint your way. We want to see your personality. Okay, so I am at the 80% mark. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just stop painting because I don't want to actually hide our light. I'm going to just a few more random white ones up there. So they're random. I want some random, right? Okay, I got random. I'm done. And my brain is gonna tell me, oh no, there's some spot you missed or it's not perfect. And I'm gonna just tell my brain, that's nice, take a break, have some more wine. And I'm gonna go ahead and sign my painting and I'm gonna sign it in gray, but you can sign it in red, any color you want. So where I have that black, I just add a tiny bit of white. I'm chiseling it on the side of my plate to get a finer point spinning my brush and my fingers quarter turn back and forth to get a finer point. And then I'm gonna come down here and I'm just gonna put my initials. Boop, that's it. And I'm calling this baby done. Done, there's some big lines in there, let's see. If I do that, that's kind of cool. Boop. Now this is where I could get into trouble if I just start tinkering, right? So I better stop. But I kind of like that actually, little Oh, contrast to break it up. See that right there? That's what I was going for. All right, stop, Nance. I'm done. And you take all the time you want. You can pause your recording and just relax and enjoy your painting. Enjoy finishing your painting. And thank you so much for painting with us today. Really appreciate it. Um, we are 
uh, at Sipping and Painting Hamden and uh, in Denver, Colorado. We offer virtual classes, we offer fundraisers, we offer, um, when things get back to normal after the pandemic, we'll do some more Bob Ross classes and we'll do watercolor classes. We're gonna uh, paint some Christmas ornaments to give as gifts. And uh, we've got all kinds of fun things coming up. So uh, we hope you join us for another class. Thanks so much, take care and keep painting. Bye-bye.